Well, welcome to Resurrection Sunday 2016, approximately the 1,990th time Christians have celebrated the anniversary of the resurrection of Jesus Christ since it happened about 2,000 years ago. I hope that everyone received communion when they came in. If you didn't get communion yet today, uh, make sure you do that before you leave. It was Jesus himself who instituted our remembrance of him. Uh, giving his perfect life as a sacrifice to pay for all of our sins. Christ died for our sins according to scriptures, and he was buried and he was raised on the third day, which is from 1 Corinthians. So follow along with me now, Matthew chapter 28. After the Sabbath, at the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb where Jesus lay. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel of the, said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, now I've told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them, greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid, go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were still on their way, some of the guards went in the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say his disciples came during the night and stole away his body while we were asleep. If the report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed, and this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Then the eleven went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When he saw them, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And real quickly, uh, Jesus said, Go and make disciples of all nations. We know this command was not just for 11 disciples, it was for all of us, because he said, Teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you, including this command to go and make disciples. So this is a perpetuating command from the time of Christ to this very day. We're here because of this verse. We're here because Jesus said, go out and tell everybody, make everybody disciples, teach people to obey everything that God has taught us, and then we're supposed to go out and do the same, bring people to Christ. So see how that goes around and around and around again. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to read verses 3 through 8. The Apostle Paul is writing. Now, Paul wasn't one of the original 12 apostles, was he? So he didn't see all this firsthand. So listen to what he writes in verse 3 there. For what I received, what I heard, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised to life on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas. Now, Cephas is another name for Peter, okay? And then went to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. So he, he appeared to more than that, but this is one meeting of 500 people, and the resurrected Jesus Christ appeared before all of them. And at the time Paul is writing this, listen to what he says. Most of these 500 people are still living, though some have fallen asleep, some have, have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. Remember Paul? His first name was Saul. Originally he was Saul. What was he doing? He was going around trying to stamp out Christianity. 
He says he was using his vote for the death penalty. He was dragging families apart, dragging people into jail. What would have changed a man like this? What would have changed a guy that was trying to kill Christians and throw them in jail? Well, he said he just met the resurrected Jesus Christ. And that fried his mind. That changed his whole perspective. Everything changed after he met the resurrected Jesus Christ. Today we're going to be taking a look at Good Friday and Easter and what it all means. And uh, I went back and I looked at some of the old sermons we had for Easter, 2012, 13, 14, and 15, and, and I really liked what I did in those. And so today I did something completely different. And uh, if you've been around the church a couple of years, you've heard me do this kind of message before every once in a while. Uh, I want to talk about why we believe and what the world would look like if we didn't believe. So we're going to go off in a direction that's going to be more meaningful for some people than other people. But I trust that all of us can be prayerful and that uh, you'll ask God to help you get out of this, uh, something that will be a blessing to you today. We're going to do this in the context of of the two grand stories of how the human race arose. There's two big theories, two competing themes about how the human race came to be, how we developed, and ultimately, why you are here listening to this message today. Because, I mean, that part we all agree on, right? You're here, unless you're listening on the internet or the television. But you're, all of you who are in this room, we can agree that all of you are, are here today. Uh, and there's two, gonna be two explanations for why that might have happened. Depending on which of these meta-narratives makes more sense to you, the message of Easter is either going to be a historical cultural footnote, something that came from the time of Christ, people in the Dark Ages, the Medieval Ages, the Europeans that spread across the world, something that some people uh, celebrate primarily marked with colored eggs and chocolate bunnies, or if the other meta narrative makes more sense to you, Easter is going to change your life. I mean, it has to. That would be the only reasonable response. It's going to change your life beyond recognition. You're never going to be the same again. If it's true that God loves you, He loves you even though we're messed up sinners, and He died for our sins, and He rose again and says, I'm going to give eternal life and forgiveness to anybody that would put their faith in me and follow me, that's going to change you forever. So we've got these two theories. All right. One story about humanity goes like this. Approximately 14 billion years ago, the universe was created out of nothing. About 300 years later, after this huge explosion, uh, matter and energy start to clump up. They start to form atoms. Uh, these start to form simple molecules, and you have stars and these stars grow over billions of years and explode and then from the residue of these stars we get some some more complex molecules some heavy heavier materials heavy metals about 3.8 billion years ago the earth is formed and very quickly simple organisms appear in on earth and life develops this life explodes into a wide variety of ever-evolving organisms. And about 70,000 years ago, we have the first of what we would call modern humans. And here's the interesting thing. We, modern humans, are very different than any other creatures on Earth. But we're also very odd. So we're very different, but we're very odd. So we spend a lot of time arguing that we're really not that different from all the other organisms on the planet, which of course is very odd since we're the only species known to spend its time arguing that we are the same as the other animals. We're unique in this tendency. I'm, I'm reading a book right now. See, that was, you don't have dolphins sitting around saying, I think we're just like all the other animals or, or, or a bunch of elephants coming together and you know, we're really not that different than humans. Uh, we're the only ones, we're unique in the fact that we keep trying to tell ourselves we're not unique. Uh, I'm reading a book right now called Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind. Uh, very casual, well-written, fun to read. 
it makes this interesting observation about the quirkiness of humankind's evolutionary development. And you've probably heard this before if you're interested in science and you've studied these things. Today, our big brains, because human beings, we've got big brains uh, on little bodies, and our brains, even when we're resting, take up a huge percentage of our energy, much more than most other animals. So he says, today, our big brains pay off nicely. It's good to have big brains. Because we can produce cars and guns, they enable us to move much faster than chimps and shoot them from a safe distance instead of wrestling. So it's good that we've got big brains because we can make cars and shoot chimpanzees from far away. Uh, but cars and guns are a recent phenomenon. For more than two million years, if you're going back to the precursors of humanity in this narrative, human neural networks kept growing and growing but apart from some flint knives and pointed sticks, humans had precious little to show for it. What then drove forward the evolution of the massive human brain using all this energy during those two million years? Frankly, we don't know. But, you know, speaking as a human being myself, and presumably that's most of us in the audience today, I'm glad that, if this narrative is true, I'm glad that for millions of years we used more and more energy on our brains and less and less on muscles and in bone fragments and fangs and claws and a, a thick hide that would have helped us survive back then because the human brain allows us now to have our language and culture and all the things that make us so uniquely human. If we hadn't made it through that two million year long period of diminished survivability before combustion engines and gunpowder kicked in, we would not be here today. So. Good thing we did. And many of the things that make us different from the rest of the animal kingdom are just bizarre. And this is, this is something that I do with my free time. I like to think, sit around and think, what makes us different than animals? How are we different? An article I was reading in Time Magazine this week on tears uh, noted that no other animal cries the way human beings do. Isn't that a weird thing? I mean, there's so many things that are different about humans and other animals. Again, including the unique fact that we like to tell ourselves we're not different. But, but human beings, our tears are different. Now, other animals may tear up when they're frustrated uh, at something, but we express tears for so many reasons. We have tears of joy. We have tears of awe and wonder, like, oh, that is so awesome. Uh, we have tears just thinking about the possible death or illness of somebody we love. I mean, we have tears for, for everything, and we're totally unique in this sense. Why do humans cry the way we do? Why are we different? My favorite theory, although to be fair, uh, the article noted that no one really believes this, but I did see it on a, a, a documentary on television once. But my favorite theory that Time Magazine article wrote about is that we are descended from aquatic apes and we evolved tears to clean the salt water out of our eyes. So that's one just so story. That's possible. Uh, the article proposed several other ideas, including, they quoted Darwin. Darwin looked at tears, and I think he was probably fed up with his wife or something. He said, tears are evolutionary dead end. They serve no purpose. So he was not a big fan of tears. Uh, but this article mostly settled on the reason for tears are perhaps they're an evolutionary adaptation to elicit sympathy from others. We and they said uh, they've measured human anger. And when you see somebody crying, sometimes your anger diminishes. Uh, when you're about to be violent and you see somebody crying, sometimes your violence diminishes. So they said it's an evolutionary adaptation to elicit sympathy from others. The article I, I noticed was silent on why human observers may have evolved the ability to feel sympathy when seeing water leak from another per human's eyes as opposed to their mouth or ears, I guess. That you, Nobody feels sympathy when somebody's leaking water. Like, why are you leaking water out of your head, you know? But so, so maybe we evolved tears to make sympathy come from other people, but it doesn't say why people evolved to feel sympathy when they see that in another person. But these examples just cause us to think of all the ways that humans are different than other animals. Some of the differences are in degree. For example, we find some animals using a kind of proto-language but nothing really comes close to human language, does it? Nothing at all. Uh, our ability to express emotions, complex emotions, 
relationships, abstract concepts, longing, mathematics. Remember we called mathematics the language of God? It's going to be the same. If you're on an alien planet, no matter where you are in the galaxy and the universe, math is the same. Math is the language of heaven. Math never changes. Uh, we use language for morality, whereas, or as I've already pointed out, our species is a unique in our tendency to discuss amongst ourselves how we're really no different than other animals. No other animal has been observed uh, communicating, talking about how they're really no different from uh, human beings or other animals. We are apparently alone in the animal kingdom and trying to convince ourselves that we're just like all the other animals. Again, that's a unique tendency. That's bizarre. It, I don't know why we would have avowed that. And, and think, about, think about music. Have you ever listened to a, sympathy, a, a symphony? Complex in all the different melodies. You set up the melody and then it disappears for a while, then it comes and weaves its way back in. All these different instruments and human beings playing a piano or a violin without, you know, by memorization, you wonder, wow, how did that evolve? How did that evolve? In, in the, the idea of rhythm, which I think rhythm and music are also tied to mathematics, right? And there's something that's attractive about form and structure to the human mind that we just feel like this is sublime, this is beautiful. Using music to stir memories, using music to tell stories, dream dreams, meditate on beauty and truth, the future, using music to glorify God. Have you ever listened to music and thought why and wondered, where did that come from? How did that just happen? Remember, evolution. And by the way, I hate it when we Christians act like evolution is a bad word, a swear word, or science is a bad word. Uh, these, are, these are not, <laughs> these are just terms to describe. Uh, uh, these are just things, evolution is a way to describe change over time. If it's more acceptable, when I say evolution, you can think adaptation, all right? Just think adaptation in your own mind. Uh, have you under, ever wondered how the human race adapted to be able to compose music? Remember, naturalistic evolution. I'm talking about life just came about. There's no God. There's no designer. It just came about, and it gradually changed, gradually changed, gradually changed until we have rocket science, neuroscience, and symphonies. If naturalistic evolution, if there is no God, it is directionless. Evolution is not always progressing. That's a myth. Evolution has no direction. Things don't evolve towards a goal. There's no preset idea like, we want to get to that point. Evolution doesn't do that. Mutations happen, and they're either incorporated into the species because they, because they don't matter one way or another, and so you just keep reproducing, or... Uh, they may aid in procreation or survivability, or in most cases, actually all observable cases. Uh, mutations confer no benefit and are, in fact, detrimental, and so they're weeded out because, you know, you grow an extra ear on your nose, it's, you're less likely to mate, and your, your genes aren't going to follow through, so they get weeded out. So how did humans evolve? the ability to create and enjoy music? Well, again, the answer is nobody knows. Nobody knows. I have heard some fellas, some scientists, call it a happy side effect of some other as yet unidentified adaptation that must have actually helped us survive and have babies. But symphonies, space travel, and poetry really do seem like overkill at times. All we needed to do to ensure the survivability of the human species was to outcompete other predators so that we could survive and pass on our genetic code. We didn't need to be able to make symphonies, to be able to look at the moon and wonder what's up there and get up there. No other creature does that. We're really, really weird. One way that human beings are described sometimes in science, and, and this makes sense to me, uh, again, if there's no God directing everything, not just humans, but every organism is actually just a mechanism to continue a biological program, like a computer program. This is a biological program called DNA. DNA is biological code written in molecules that, for whatever reason, 
is programmed to reproduce itself continually as long as possible, and that's what we call life. So it, it, the urge of, of, the, of DNA is to keep itself replicating, to keep itself surviving. Now, this biological program has just so happened to work out in human beings so that we have a capacity to rejoice and be in awe of nature. Uh, one of my favorite things is to be in a bamboo forest in Japan, the way the light just flickers through those trees because it's a very airy light. It's a green light and the, the dappled light all over the ground, waving in the wind. Somehow, this mechanism, which is here just to replicate DNA, woke up and said, wow, I like sunlight and shadows. It's beautiful to me. We rejoice at the sound of songbirds and, and beauty and colors. Colors just fill up our soul. We like to see all the colors and the dancing uh, lights and the shadows and the sounds of storms, the sound of wind, the sound of waves crashing on a beach, the sound of wind blowing through trees or, for, or through grass fields. Something deep inside is inspired apparently a happy side effect of survival of the fittest. Nature red in tooth and claw, and one day we woke up and said, boy, that's kind of wonderful, isn't it? I got blood all over my face. Grog, you hear that? What? No, you hear that? Oh, that is sublime, my friend. Yeah, I mean, what is that? A happy side effect of something else. Humans have complex moral questions. By the way, Sometimes people say, well, this, you can't answer this moral question, therefore morality doesn't exist. As if, do we say, well, that's a difficult math question, so I guess math doesn't exist. That doesn't make any sense. But complex moral questions, things that are hard, okay? It's not easy to know the right answer sometimes. And we plot the courses of stars in the sky. We measure the speed of light. We're able to determine where all the stars were up in the sky, where they must have been a million years ago or a billion years ago. We can... We can go backwards, and we have, and we stand upright. We lack fur. We have relatively weak teeth and claws and eyes. Our noses are worthless. We have specialized thumbs. That's good. We wear clothes just like geckos or, you know who does wear clothes? I've seen dogs wear clothes. But we're kind of unique in that, you know. Uh, we have babies that can't run or walk or survive on their own for, a ye for years after they're born. I think about 20 or so. <laughs> and why is it that the one animal on the planet that is the most different and unusual physically is also the one animal on the planet that can tell you where in the relation to the rest of the Milky Way galaxy our sun and our star is and where we are. Now, we just take that for granted because we're just so used, we don't ask questions. But why is physically the most unique and different animal also the only one who does all this moral thinking, the only one who can do the science and find out where we are in the Milky Way galaxy and understand that our star, our sun, we think we call it the sun, it's big. It's just one of a trillion stars in our galaxy. And our galaxy is only one of approximately a trillion galaxies in the universe. And we look the most different, and we have brains that can go out and play in this universe that was either created by accident or created by God, who said, go out and figure it out. Two big stories about the human race, two meta-narratives. If naturalistic explanations are all that we have, you know, it didn't have to turn out this way, that we would look like this, that we would think like this. All the things we think make us special and uniquely human are probably just this way by chance. They didn't have to evolve this way, probably shouldn't have evolved this way. And what does that mean for who we are? What makes us human? Again, it's an accident. Music did not have to be. If, if all we have is naturalistic explanations, it's very easy to imagine an alien race on some alien planet would have no interest in music. They'd be like most of the other animals on our planet who just 
just all sounds. It didn't have to be that music captures something we call a soul deep down inside of us. Did not have to be. It's incidental, not central, to be an intelligent being. Morality, dumb luck. Altruism and empathy may have helped our species to survive. So we call these things good, right? It's good to have empathy for another person. It's good to have empathy for other beings. But we can easily imagine another race of humans, you know, multiple competing races of humanity on the earth at the same time, or, or maybe aliens again on another planet that could have evolved differently so that they would not see empathy as a moral good. Maybe they would see taking care of the sick as a waste of resources. Maybe trying to help the old states keep up with the pack is, is uh, just a way to, to, to make our genetic code weak. The helpless, saving the helpless as immoral and a waste of limited resources. See, even empathy, even our moral impulses didn't have to evolve this way. They're arbitrary. Just make up your own rules for what's right or what's wrong. How about laughter? You know, we can laugh for joy. We can laugh out of relief because we thought the situation could be horrible, and we just, oh, thank goodness, things turned out better than we thought. We can laugh because there's mirth in the air. We're with good friends. We're with family. Laugh because we're so glad to be with these people that we love, enjoying these precious good moments together. Or you can have a sharp bark of derision. Ha! You notice that both our laughs, and they're both so different. Looking down, laughing down at somebody because they're, they're not as smart as we are. They're, they're not cool. They don't understand. Or they, they're just different. Mean, heartless laughter. If laughter is a byproduct of evolution, something we develop by chance, then on what basis can we say that one kind of laughter is better than another kind of laughter? We can't. The second meta narrative. It's found in the book of Genesis, chapter 1. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In, his, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every single living thing that moves on the earth. Right off the bat, we see this explanation of all the things that are different. The uniqueness of humanity actually is not explainable from blind chance and circumstance. It just is. There's no reason for it. Why we are the way we are makes all the sense in the world in the context of uh, the Christian story we find in the Bible. The human race, not an accident. And we are not the same as other life. Right away, God said we're special. We're made in God's image. We're told to rule over, to take care of the earth as stewards. Different. You are different than beetles. You are different than toads. You are different than water buffalo for a reason, for a purpose. God created us to be like him, to have fellowship with him, to be loved by God and to love God in return. Genesis goes on to tell us, though, that the human race is fallen. We're fallen. We're messed up. We're broken inside. Deep down inside, we're broken. That's why we're not just like, if we were just like a robot, we'd do something wrong and we'd never do it again. That ain't the case because we've got sin in our hearts. There's this rebellion. We're fighting with God. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm going to make my own rules. We're at war with God because we fell away from our good purpose. We're broken, not as we should be. The world is messed up. You don't believe it? Turn on the news. You don't believe it? Look at your own heart. You ever hit your head on a wall? Said, I'm not going to do that again. You end up back, bam, do it again. We're broken. This is sin. We disobey our loving Heavenly Father. This is what the Bible means by sin. And again, human beings are unique. You know, there's no such thing as a sinful chameleon. No such thing as a sinful amoeba. 
No such thing as a sinful lion. Well, what if the lion eats somebody? Yeah, that's kind of what lions do. He's not being sinful because he eats somebody. We human beings are unique. Other animals may overgraze a plane and cause it to, to desert, desertification, you know? Too, much, too many animals, too many herds, too much eating. Other animals may kill and eat the last representative of endangered species. What if a tiger eats the last bird of its kind? <gasps> you are so immoral. You ate the last... The tiger what? <laughs> you know? We are the sinners. Animals are not sinful. There is no sinful tree out there either. Plants are not sinful. Look at this sinful grass. Ooh, I just hate the way you're not growing there properly. No. We know we're the messed up ones. Even if you're not a Christian, you know we're the messed up ones. We are sinners. Other animals might get into a hen house and kill all the hens for sport and not eat them. But we never think these animals are sinners. They're just animals being animals. But we think of human beings differently. And when we see cruelty, that's wrong. It's wrong to be cruel. We see greed. That ain't right. It's wrong to be greedy. Wastefulness, dispensation of all sorts. We have a word for it. It's wickedness. This is wickedness. This is sin. And we know it's wrong because deep down inside, we all know that humans are different than everything else. There's no such thing as sinful rock, sinful plant, sinful animal. And we made a mess of this planet that we were given to take, take care of. And by the way, this is where Good Friday comes in. This is Good Friday. Why is it Good Friday when Jesus died on the cross? What's so good about this good man dying on a cross? It's because Jesus saw God, saw our mess. And God didn't say, God didn't see a world full of divorce and pain and war and hunger in, in people using other people and all the tears and the brokenness and the hopelessness, God didn't look down there and say, heck if I care. God did not look down at our planet and say to some angel, why don't you go down and do something about it? Or, 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 or why don't you go die for these folks? He loved us so much, he incarnated himself. God became flesh to suffer and die for our sins. He said, I'm the sinless one, so I can take responsibility. I'm becoming just like you, so I can represent humanity. And he took all of our sins. That means every nasty thing I've ever thought, every mean-spirited thing I've ever said to somebody, every selfish impulse I've ever had was dumped on Jesus Christ, and he died on the cross. Thank you, God. That's why it's Good Friday, because I'm free. I've been forgiven of my sin. I am forgiven completely because all of our sins together can't compare to the goodness of God. So God took our sin, he nailed it to the cross, and that's Good Friday. But you know what? The story doesn't end there. If it did, there wouldn't be any hope. Jesus promised before he died, he says, I'm going to die and I'm popping back up again. Here's the truth about love. The first narrative, love, sorry, that's a poetic word, but it's just biological impulse. We're talking about chemical reactions here. Or, second story, love is this desire, this, this passion, this understanding that I desire the best for you. I, I want to see you living. I want to see you in, in righteousness and in goodness. I want to see you blessed and, and willing to suffer for somebody else to have that blessing. And that's love. And God proved to us when he rose again from the dead that love is so strong, not even death can hold it down. Love is so strong that not even death can overcome it. And when Jesus rose again, that was actually the death of death because he's promised eternal life to everyone who would also put their faith in him. So there we have it. Two grand story arcs about humanity. The first one, right or wrong, tries to explain how humanity came to be. But by definition, you know what? It really can't shed any light on why humanity came to be. Let's say all that science was correct. It still didn't tell you why you're here, why you're here. The second narrative tells us both how and why. How? Because God willed it and he spoke it. Why? He created us like him because he wanted us to be with him. Listen to this. If you don't start with the assumption, if you don't start with the assumption that if there was a God, it would be impossible for him, her, she, it to accomplish a resurrection, if you don't start with that assumption, then it seems very reasonable to assert that if there were a God, there's really no rational basis. Somebody could make a trillion 
galaxies, each with an average of a trillion stars, there's no rational basis for asserting that if he, she, it could not, uh, could not bring about a resurrection of the dead. I mean, why not? If the second narrative is true, everything's easy for God. Inclu including cleaning up our lives, getting us right with him. Further, if we don't put our minds in some box, put it, our minds in a little box and declare that since a resurrection is outside of my experience, therefore it's impossible, or because it doesn't fit my preconceptions of reality is impossible, if we don't do that, we're going to find ourselves agreeing with the Harvard law professor, Dr. Dr. Simon Greenleaf, Harvard law professor who wrote, According to the laws of legal evidence used in courts of law, there is more evidence for the historical fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ than for just about any other event in history. Now quickly, and I'm almost done here, I want to go through some evidences of the resurrection. There are many. I'm going to go quick. One, empty grave. Now think about this. If the apostles were going to die, lie about, if they were just going to lie about Jesus Christ resurrecting, They'd be idiots not to say, oh, it was a spiritual resurrection. His body is still there, but he, he, he popped us spiritually and we saw his ghost. I mean, nobody can prove you wrong. If you're going to tell a lie, that's what you're going to say. If you're going to say, no, his body's back alive, all the authorities have to do is say, hello, we've got the, and then they went and looked and there was no body. The empty tomb is powerful evidence because it made Christianity easy to refute. All the Romans had to do is show that body. All the Jewish leadership had to do was show that body, but they couldn't. The first eyewitnesses to the resurrection happened to be women. Now, here's the thing. In that culture, women were really seen as secondary citizens. In fact, a woman's testimony was looked down, looked down on so far that they couldn't even testify in court. A woman's testimony meant nothing in court. Now, if you're making up a religion, if you're making up a story, why the heck would you... Why would you have women be the first ones to, uh, to witness the resurrection of Jesus Christ? The reason the Bible says the women saw first was because, the most likely explanation is because the women saw first. The women saw first. You would not make this up if you could, do, if you, if you could just make up any story you want. You're, gonna have, you're just going to make some very elite males uh, find the resurrected Christ first. Number three. It's always good in a court of law to have hostile witnesses affirm what you're saying. The hostile witnesses say the body was stolen away. Now, what's the good part about that? It means the people against Jesus admitted the body's gone. Hostile witnesses said, we put the body in a tomb, we put a seal, we rolled a big rock, we sealed the rock, and we had guards around it, and the body is gone. So they had to make up a story about how it, the body would have been taken away. Uh, number four, almost all the apostles were willing to die for their belief in Christ. Now, you're probably thinking, well, there was just a bunch of yahoos in Belgium that blew themselves up for their beliefs, thought they'd go up there and get a bunch of virgins. Listen, those folks died for what they believed to be true. The apostles would have known if it was a lie that Jesus resurrected. They said, we met the resurrected Jesus Christ. The apostle Thomas says, his hands and his side were right there. I saw the holes. They would have known if they're just making up a story. Instead, they take this story, they go everywhere, and they're willing to suffer hardship. They're willing to be on the run, no place to stay, just to tell people this is true. God loves you. The resurrection happened. You can have eternal life. You can have forgiveness of your sins. And they were willing to die for this. Now, people are willing to die for a lie because they believe it because they believe it to be true, but they would have known whether it's true or not, and they died uh, telling this story that Christ uh, rose from the dead. Number five, not only do we have the eyewitness accounts, which people say you can't use the Bible to prove anything. Remember, when the Bible was written, it was Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, where weren't part of the New Testament. They were separate accounts. And then Paul wrote, we read in, in 1 Corinthians, right? Paul wrote about his accounts. So we have these separate accounts each verifying uh, what it said. It, so we don't not only have the eyewitness accounts, but you know what? It's so cool. We have the accounts of first-generation pastors. There's a fellow named Papias, another guy named Polycarp, who actually spoke with the original apostles 
and we have their writings too. And he said, yep, Jesus Christ rose from the dead, just like we heard from the first apostles. So we not only have the Bible, but we have extra biblical writing affirming this. I already talked about the conversion of Saul Paul. Remember Saul going around throwing Christians in jail, trying to divide up families, casting his vote to kill Christians. And suddenly he's this missionary that goes everywhere telling people about Jesus, and he too dies for his faith in Christ. And you know what he said? He said, I met the resurrected Jesus Christ. I met Jesus Christ uh, alive again. It changed everything. Then there's small bits in the Bible. They're odd inclusions if Jesus did not resurrect. For example, some of the apostles doubted even after they met the resurrected Jesus Christ. It was like, this is, I see it, but it's too unbelievable. Even Christ said it was going to happen. I can't wrap my head around this. Now, if you're writing it, you're just making up a story. You wouldn't wrote, and they met and saw the rest of Jesus Christ, but they still doubted, or some still doubted. That inclusion is bizarre if you're just making the story up. But if some of them, I see it, but I can't believe it, then you would include it because that was the truth. It was too unbelievable. So and you know what some of them did? Resurrected Jesus Christ, they go back to fishing. Don't know what they do. <coughs> they didn't know what to do next. The New Testament doesn't always portray the apostles in a good light. The New Testament records that Christ's own brothers didn't believe in him during the time of the Gospels. But suddenly in the book of Acts and then Paul's writing, you have the brothers of Jesus and they're Christians and leaders in the church. The Bible doesn't tell us how this happened, but the thing that happened in between them not believing Jesus and being leaders in the church was the resurrection. Hey, I'm your older brother, and I'm God in the flesh. Yeah, right. And then you die, and you resurrect again. Okay, maybe there's something to what you said. And suddenly, the brothers of Jesus Christ who didn't believe when he was alive are believers and leaders in the church. And then, of course, there's the explosive impact of the resurrection on our world, reshaping the entire world. Suddenly, Christianity went everywhere and changed everything. It was for reasons like these and many more. The renowned atheist, Anthony Flew. He later became a deist. There's some folks who hope he became a Christian, but he's dead now. We don't know. Anthony Flew, who all his life was an enemy of Christianity, wrote, the evidence for the resurrection is better than for claim miracles in any other religion. It's outstandingly different in quality and quantity. And incidentally, by the way, the resurrection is the one miracle of Christ on which all of Christianity hangs. Because Jesus said, I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again in three days. I spoke about all the happy coincidences of naturalism, that humans just evolved the way we are. Well, maybe all the evidence for the resurrection is just a nice, happy accident as well. A happy coincidence that the one miracle that all of Christianity hangs on is also the one miracle in all the world's religions that is the most strongly attested. Let me speak pl plainly. If I were a non-believer, I think this would be something I would want to take some time to think about. Why is it that the one miracle that matters most is the one miracle that has the most evidence to it? And the implications are tremendous. Easter has been called the soul's first taste of spring. The hardship, the weariness, the world weariness, the sin-sick heart. Upset at the world, upset at myself. If the resurrection is true, then love is true and God cares about me. Hope is real. Forgiveness is possible as our repentance and meaning. Christ said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he may die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Christ was going for all the marbles, wasn't he? Christ was going for your soul, for your life, for your everything. Jesus said, do you believe this? This question echoes in eternity. All across the world, in every culture, in every country, there are people gathering together like us who said, yes, I believe. God, your ways are much better than my ways. And I want to follow you. I want to love you. I want to be more like you. Jesus says, do you believe? Not long after this, he himself died. And you know what? He rose again to show that he means what he says. See, your math teacher or your phi ed teacher can say, I'm God. Do you believe me? When Jesus says, come to me, believe, and then he dies and comes back, 
that adds a little bit of credibility. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, talks about Christ's death and resurrection and the implications of it in Romans 10, 9 through 13. This is my last verse for today. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to give you an invitation to surrender your heart to Jesus Christ. Now we're going to pray together to get right with the Lord. It's come to Jesus time. Good thing to do on Easter, right? Listen, Romans 10, 9 through 13. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You'll be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, with the mouth resulting in salvation. Now the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame, will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew or Greek. All people are the same, since the same Lord is uh, Lord of all, and he's rich in mercy to everyone who calls on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, not 5%, not 10%, not a handful. Everyone, this is the promise of God, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So here's the invitation. Brothers and sisters, if you're a longtime Christian, use this time now. We're going to pray together to get right with the Lord. Say, Lord, I've been off. I've been wandering. Lord, I've had some, some wrong priorities. I want to get right with you. And if you're not sure if you've ever gotten that done, if you've never prayed and said, Lord, forgive my sins. I want to give my heart to you. I want to follow you. I want to invite you. There's no time like the present. Let's get it done right now. Let's pray together and talk to this loving Heavenly Father who came. He died for us. He rose again in power. And guess what? Because of him, because of love, our lives can have purpose and meaning that will echo in eternity. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, again, here we are, such as we are. Lord, you see us, you see all the nastiness, all the sin, all the, all the things we're not proud of, God. We don't want anybody else to see. Lord, you see it all. There's no hiding from you, so we're not going to pretend anymore. We're not going to make excuses. We're not going to blame other folks, Lord. God, here we are, and we know our ways are not as good as your ways. Lord, we confess that you are beautiful, you're holy, you're good, that your ways are best. Lord, please forgive us. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for our sins, for taking responsibility, taking on the punishment we deserve, Lord. Lord, we don't want to go to hell. We don't want to be eternally separated from you. We want to be forgiven. We want to be raised to new life. Lord, we want to have this promise of eternal life. Father, please, you promise that everyone who calls on your name will be saved. Lord, we're calling. Lord, save. You're a good God. Please reach down, grab a hold of us, help us to walk in the newness of life with you. Lord, let this Resurrection Sunday, this Easter 2016, Lord, let it be a day of remembrance, the day we surrendered ourselves to you. We came back to you, Lord. We grabbed a hold of you. Lord, teach us your ways. Grant us your peace. Fill us with your understanding. Help us to be people that are full of blessing, not cursing. Lord, help us to be your children, not just in word, but in deed. Lord, we ask that you would bless all of our dear, precious children, Lord. This is a hard world. This is a rough life. Lord, the world could do some bad things, nasty things to our kids. Lord, we pray that each child in our church will grow up to love you, to love your will, to love other people, Lord, to be more like you, Lord, that you would put your shield of protection around them, Lord, that you would strengthen them, grant them courage, Lord, build them up, Father, that they would grow up to be mighty men of God, beautiful, strong women of God, Lord, uh, children that will become people that will live their lives for your truth, your ways, Lord that will make a difference in our society, Lord, because they're living for you first and foremost, not for themselves. Lord, thank you for this time we've had together. Please bless us. Help us to hold on tight. Help us to not forget what we've learned here this morning, Lord. And help us to share your truth with everyone around us. We pray this in your name, Lord. Thank you for listening. Amen. Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com.